that later. Yeah, he's coughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Marion County Board of Commissioners weekly board session. Today is Wednesday, July 27th. It's 9 a.m. We're in the Senator hearing room at 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. And as we do every week, please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Someday, I think that <clears throat> Sharon back there should turn our microphones on early before board session so you can all hear our small talk. Mm. <laughs> it's Probably pretty entertaining not. sometimes. Mm. All right. Council advises against that. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. They just learn a lot about your weekend. It's, she's all. just advising. That's all. All right. Uh, we'll start with <laughs> public comment. And we do have one individual signed up today. Walt, would you please join us over here? Sure. You're welcome. And standard rules three minutes and please introduce yourself yes name and uh, residence for the record Man. good morning everybody uh, I'm Walt Peters I'm a resident of South Salem and uh, this morning I'd actually like to offer uh, a public apology uh, and in this case I, I usually don't do this but I, I wrote or I typed out what I wanted to say so I wouldn't mince my words together. So fellow beloved community members of Marion County, <clears throat> at our recent July 13th board session during the public comment segment, I made an announcement regarding the address of 777 Commercial Street NE in Salem. The comment centered on a photo showing this address in November of 2020. At that time, November of 2020, the building at this address was only a frame during the construction process. I had explained that from this address, 87 names were listed as registered voters, and from those names, there were 53 what we call yes votes from the November 2020 federal election. On that date of July 13th when I made that announcement, I was unaware that we actually have two addresses in Salem that are, that are identified with 777 Commercial Street. One of these addresses has a, it's called a post direction of NE. The other address has a post direction of SE. <clears throat> there was a common error that I have uh, seen repeatedly with the public voter roll information that comes from the state of Oregon for Marion County. One of the listings for 77 Commercial Street SE had been given a post direction of NE. This address that I just referred to with the NE, it had been listed as in what we call an anomaly during canvassing efforts from earlier in 2022. When I went to further investigate the situation, I did not recognize the two different post directions. The real address in question was actually 77 Commercial Street SE, and then with all of these addresses, there's a unit number with three digits. <clears throat> so I want to announce that these are legitimate addresses for a building called the Meridian which is located near the intersection of Commercial and Mission Street. For this oversight, I take full responsibility for my error. I should have recognized this detail prior to announcing what should, <clears throat> what ha I, excuse me. For this oversight, I take full responsibility for my error. I should have recognized this detail prior to announcing what had been discovered. It is sincerely not my intention nor do I believe it is anyone else's intention with our group Oregon People's Vote to mislead the citizens of our community. Speaking for myself, I am only looking to bring truth to us, we the people of Marion County. Thank you and God bless the United States of America. Thanks, Thank you. Walt. Have a good day. Okay, we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. Commissioner Willis, would you read that? We'd be happy to. <laughs> uh, 
Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the consent agenda under Health and Human Services Approved Amendment Number Five to the lease agreement with the Oregon State Hospital to add forty-three thousand two hundred dollars for a new contract total of two hundred one thousand six hundred dollars for Marion County Health and Human Services to continue to lease cottage number R O three located at two four three five Greenway Drive Northeast. It's retroactive to July first, twenty twenty-two, through June thirtieth, twenty twenty-five. And to approve amendment number six to the lease agreement with the Oregon State Hospital to add $36,000 for a new contract total of $168,000 for Marion County Health and Human Services to continue to lease cottage number R14 located at 555 24th Place Northeast, retroactive to July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. And now I'll move on to our first item under action for Board of Commissioners. Consider approval of the American Rescue Plan ARPA subrecipient agreement with the City of Aurora in the amount of a million dollars for the downtown core water transmission line improvement project through December 31st, 2026. Debbie and Camber, oh, you're sitting together today. It's a Good team morning. effort. <laughs> <laughs> we're, in the, we're, we're tied at the hip here. Uh, Debbie Gregg, uh, Grants Manager, Finance Department. Amber Schlag, Contracts and Procurement Manager in Finance. Good morning. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we are bringing before you uh, uh, an American Rescue Plan Act award agreement for the City of Aurora for your consideration. As a brief recap, who, um, whoever is late to the ARPA party, um, <laughs> <laughs> Marion County was directly allocated over $67 million of coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, that's the arm of ARPA, um, funding that we have been awarded as a result of this um, um, direct allocation. There was an application process early in the year where the commissioners awarded funds for various projects that we have previously presented um, at uh, other board sessions, um, approximately about 25 agreements. Um, and Camber's going to go over the agreement today to discuss the Aurora project. Okay, good morning. The city of, city of Aurora water system serves the domestic water needs within the industrial and commercial areas, but the existing distribution system needs to be upsized and the property looped. Many existing water lines in the downtown core area of the city are old, deteriorating, undersized, and constructed from inadequate materials. This project includes the replacement of water lines along Main Street Northeast from First Street to Ottaway Road, the existing water lines along this path range from six to eight inches and are constructed from asbestos, cement, steel, and PVC material. The pipelines will re be replaced with a 12 inch water line. Uh, this process or project will also uh, replace water lines along Highway 99 East um, from 3rd Street to Bob's Avenue, and that will be replaced with 10 inch water line. All pre-construction services should be completed around March 2025 and construction will begin and be completed by December of 2026. The total project budget for this replacement is $5,284,203 of which um, the ARPA award of $1 million will go towards construction costs. Okay. Qu uh, yeah. Question, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Are they using any of their art? I mean, Aurora probably got a very small amount of ARPA. Are they putting their ARPA money towards this project as well? Yes, they are. Great. That's good. And I feel like they passed a bond, like a significant or something, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, to make this all, all work. Congratulations, Aurora. Do you have anything? I do not. Great. No. Commissioner Cameron, would you make the motion? I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. I'll move that uh, we approve of the American Rescue Plan Act sub-recipient agreement with the City of Aurora in the amount of $1 million for the downtown core water transmission line improvements project through December 31st, 2026. All second motion. A motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Just, just Madam Chair, this is the kind of thing that we, we wanted our ARPA monies to go that would make a difference for future generations, and this is the type of thing that we're really happy and to get that money and be able to see it go towards uh, infrastructure like this. It's great. Agreed. Thank you. No further discussion? All, discussion? all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you both for all your work on this and all the other millions of yeah. dollars. <laughs> Okay, now we'll move on to consider an ordinance 
referring a measure to the electors to prohibit the establishment of psilocybin product manufacturers and psilocybin service center operators within unincorporated Marion County. Tanisha and Jane. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Tanisha Bush. I am the government relations manager for Marion County. Today, we are presenting an ordinance for your consideration. In November of 2020, Ballot Measure 109, the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act, was passed by voters in Oregon. The ballot measure is now codified as ORS 475A. Psilocybin is a psychedelic drug found in certain mushrooms. ORS 475A allows the operation of psilocybin product manufacturing and service centers. The ORS allows local governments to adopt ordinances to prohibit these facilities in their communities. These ordinances must be referred to the voters at the next general election. Approval of this measure would prohibit the establishment of psilocybin manufacturing and service centers in the unincorporated areas of Marion County. Jane, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think there's um, just some process that we should talk about. So this is an administrative ordinance. So it's not adopted pursuant to 203. It's uh, adopted pursuant to ORS 475. Um, so um, the process for adopting an administrative ordinance is that the board consider it in two consecutive board sessions. And then it was posted last week. So we've been following that process. If the board um, chooses, it can read uh, the ordinance by unanimous consent by title twice, both today and next week. Um, on the back of the ordinance is the ballot title that will be referred to the voters. And then just another, I think, um, uh, I think consideration for the board um, in adopting this ordinance is that while um, uh, the measure passed statewide, it did not pass in Marion County. So it's my understanding that the board wants to consider this ordinance because the voters did not actually pass this particular measure. Thanks, Jane. Commissioner? Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. This is just like the uh, marijuana situation where we had an opportunity to refer it back out to the voters to let them decide again whether they would like to do this or not. And uh, it'll be up to the voters to, to whether this ordinance passes or doesn't pass. Um, so I think we're doing the right thing and letting the voters speak um, once again uh, in Marion County as to what they would want to do. I'd also um, mention that I think almost every other county or city is, is put these uh, up so there'll be a lot of these on the ballot. We're not the only county that is doing this. Um, and uh, I know the surrounding, I think Kaiser did it, uh, Lynn County's put it up. Uh, I don't know what other ones, but there's several that are doing this. So. Thank you. Commissioner? I just wanted to echo that. I think we're giving the people an opportunity to have their voice be heard, and um, so I feel like it's the right thing to do. Great. I don't have anything to add because I agree. <laughs> so would you please make the motion? I would. Okay. Madam Chair, I move uh, that the chair read the ordinance referring a measure to the electors to prohibit the establishment psilocybin product manufacturers and psilocybin service center operators in unincorporated Marion County by title only twice. Commissioner. I'll second that motion. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. And I will now read the title twice. An ordinance prohibiting the establishment of psilocybin product manufacturers and psilocybin service center operators within unincorporated Marion County, referral to the electors. An ordinance prohibiting the establishment of psilocybin product manufacturers and psilocybin service center operators within unincorporated Marion County, referral to the electors. And just to be clear, we're going to be discussing this again at next week's board session. So if there's members of the public who would like to show up to provide public comment, you can do so on Wednesday at 9 a.m. And you can sign up over there on that desk and tell us what you think. Great. Thank you. And now we will move on to consider approval of an ordinance amending Chapter 9.20 of the Marion County Code and declaring an emergency. Tanisha, is Sergeant Landers here? And Jane. Great. I see that. So these, trick us. 
<laughs> you know, things change at the last Lieutenant minute. was here very early, I want you to know. Oh, perfect. He was the first person here, so he was prepared. Great. Mm -hmm. He was. For the record, would you introduce yourself for us? Uh, good morning, Commissioners. I'm Jay Bergman. I'm currently the Operations Lieutenant for the Sheriff's Office. Here on behalf of Jerry, uh, Jeremy Landers, who's unexpectedly out today. Thank you. Tanisha. Perfect. Today we are considering some amendments to Chapter 9.2. 2.0 of the Marion County Code. This is in response to some gaps in our ability to handle certain complaints relating to property, including um, concerns about some illicit marijuana grows and other things that are causing problems for their neighbor. So after some work with various departments in the county, we came up with these changes, but I'm gonna go ahead and let the Lieutenant give us more detailed information on that. Hey, good morning. Uh, each year, our code enforcement team receives over a thousand complaints of code violations in Marion County. Of those, there's a handful of complaints on isolated uh, properties that significantly reduce the, uh, the livability or quality of life of the residents surrounding them with numerous calls for service for uh, criminal activity. Among those concerns are illegal marijuana grows and drug houses which accompany uh, code violations and criminal activities such as solid waste accumulation, uh, stolen property assaults. Uh, the current uh, crime nuisance code is based on ORS and has not given us the tools required to adequately deal with those prolific cases. Uh, currently, uh, the code requires three incidents within a very, or sorry, incidents from a very narrow list of crimes within a 30-day period for a, a property to be designated crime property. Um, those incidents, incidents must include or must be directly on the property and don't involve or include things that spill out into the streets um, or spill out into neighboring properties. The proposals that were uh, the changes we're proposing incorporate some things that are already in use in uh, other counties and cities, including a 400 foot buffer around the property. Uh, for things that have a direct nexus to the property. Um, the proposed changes include the three incidences with 30 days, but also add four incidences within 90 days um, and have a more expansive list of qualifying incidents such as felony, misdemeanor crimes, and code violations that have a direct threat to the health or safety of the occupants or uh, neighbors. The proposals also um, require uh, our office to work with the property owner to form an abatement plan prior to pursuing a court order to take control of the property. While, while this has been our practice uh, currently as a sheriff's office, we, we take a, a people first approach. This will codify that in there and ensure we have a balanced approach going in the, for, uh, in the future. Uh, it also um, requires us to take into account whether the property owner reported uh, the incidences and whether taking uh, action would discourage the property owner from future reporting or cooperating with our, with, uh, our office in the future. It also clarifies the notification process for uh, owners and also uh, sets up the appeal process for them. Uh, in addition, it would require our office to get approval from the board prior to pursuing action against the property owner. Thank you for that synopsis. Do you have anything else, Tanisha? No, nope, that summarizes it. Great. Well, uh, before I send it off to both of you, I just want to say thank you. I know Lieutenant Landers is not here, but uh, this was a huge lift in a quick period of time. Uh, for the public that doesn't know, uh, if you haven't watched the news, Jackson County for the last couple of years has been um, heavily involved with cartel action because of illegal marijuana and other illicit drugs. And um, the feds and state partners, county partners took action last year and that dispersed those individuals amongst our state. And we are working hard to be reactive versus, uh, or excuse me, be proactive versus reactive in our community to prevent those individuals from setting up shop in Marion County and harming property owners, um, our very valuable soil, and our neighbors. And this was, I think, a huge lift from the ordinance before as far as putting the details together and working with partners. So I wrote a list as you were talking to just to, to shout out to the Department of Ag and OLCC for their expertise, um, state police. We had a work session with them a few months ago to talk about the burdens and challenges that they're um, 
kind of under because of the amount of drug activity out in the state. Um, and then internally, our staff under Sheriff Wood, Commander Stutrude, Tadisha, um, Lieutenant Landers, and I'm sure others that I'm not aware of. Um, actually, there was somebody in Public Works, Brandon, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So thank you for that. Thank you for this. Um, and I hope that the citizens look at it and understand that this isn't our intent to try to be uh, government heavy handed. This is really about protection and conversation. And as you uh, alluded to earlier, we're gonna be very people forward in this response. Um, but this is about protecting our neighbors, specifically our farmland, which is really important to all of us because we like to eat. So, <laughs> Commissioner, do you have anything thank, to add? Thank you, Madam Chair and Lieutenant. Thank you for being here this morning on such short notice. Appreciate it, Tanisha, <laughs> for all your work. I just want to clarify not only uh, this ordinance, but the one we just did the emergency on only impact the uh, area of Marion County. Mm -hmm. So, for example, that other ordinance we passed won't affect the city of Salem. If they still want to do their yep. psilocybin mushroom thing in the city of Salem, they can. Yep. Uh, this is just only the unincorporated areas of Marion County, just yes, to sir. clarify for those, anybody who is uh, watching. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good clarification. We really need this. That's all I want to add. And I, I also want to thank you, uh, Lieutenant, and, and the whole team. I think it was said best <coughs> when Brandon Reich, our planning director, <laughs> looked at it and said, wow, this is amazing. Because, you know, we've been struggling with folks using their property to commit crimes and to um, harm their neighbors. And we've just needed a better set of tools to address that. And that's what this will be. So. As I looked at you, I realized that I forgot to thank the Farm Bureau. Okay. They've been actively involved in this discussion, obviously, because they are um, interested in protecting that land. And so, to Dylan and his team. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, I think this is a <clears throat> this gives us tools in the toolbox. It doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't give us more resources. That's right. Uh, that's right. And that that's probably the challenge is to have the resources and the time to really uh, go after some of these things, and and that'll be. Another thing we'll be working, continue to work with the legislature, the state police, and, and our department is where those resources, additional resources, are going to come from. Yeah, so. That's a good point. Yeah. I know we'll be working with our local partners on that. I just have one random question, and I do this to everybody who shows up last minute, so sorry about that. Uh, if you're a member of, this, of the community and you see something that seems odd and suspicious on land, uh, you know, out there in farmland, what's, what should they be doing? Uh, well, if, if I saw something suspicious, I, I would call the sheriff's office and report it. So are they calling the non-emergency number? Uh, yeah, I would. Great. Yeah. I just think it's important to fo for folks to understand that we don't know what you see, and you have to tell us. So calling the non-emergency number and just having a discussion with our dispatch puts information into the record, and then um, our officers can uh, be tracking that and looking into it if need be. But otherwise, we don't know what is happening out in the community because we don't have an abundance of resources. Um, while we do have some excellent resources, they're never enough. So with that, Commissioner Cameron, would you make the motion? Yes, certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I will move uh, that the chair read the ordinance by title twice, by only title twice, and uh, the ordinance amending chapter 9.20 of Marion County Code and declaring an emergency. I second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye the motion passes. And I will now read the ordinance twice. An ordinance amending Chapter 9.20 of the Marion County Code and declaring an emergency. An ordinance amending Chapter 9.20 of the Marion County Code and declaring an emergency. Thank and you again. Madam Chair, oh, yes. Yeah. Madam Chair, now I will move that we approve. Uh, the ordinance amending 9.20 of the Marion County Code and declaring an emergency. And I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Sorry about that. I skipped That's the last right. slide. Have a great day. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, now we'll move on to Health and Human Services. To consider approval of the contract for services with Salem Health in the amount of $475,000 for the delivery of mental health services retroactive to January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ryan Matthews, I'm the Administrator with Marion County Health and Human Services, and I am here requesting approval of a contract with Salem Health 
for $475,000 for calendar year 2022. And I just wanted to first talk about sort of where these funds come from. So this comes from service element 24 in our intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Health Authority for Mental Health Services. And that service element is uh, meant to go to acute inpatient services, primarily for those that are indigent or uninsured. So basically just don't have resources. This contract allows us to pay Salem Health for individuals that are suffering from acute mental illness and are potentially a threat to themselves or others and really need that inpatient uh, hospital setting. They are able to bill us to get reimbursed $1,200 per day on a daily bed rate. Uh, and this is a population that without these funds, because they don't have insurance, they would have even a more difficult time trying to get access into a bed. I mean, there would be no funding available and so hospitals would likely turn them away. Uh, we receive a little over $800,000 in this service element for the year. Uh, we've contracted $475,000 to Salem Health, and this is based on utilization, so they have to bill us you know, at that daily rate of $1,200, and, and this is an up-to amount. Uh, certainly on their side, when they're taking someone in who, ha who is uninsured, they're working to get them insurance. So usually we only have to pay for a period of time for those individuals. And then after that, you know, maybe they have Medicaid. And so uh, Medicaid would, would pay the daily bed rate ongoing. Uh, we also have other hospitals across the state that potentially sometimes we, we may be able to find a bed and locate and, and send an individual there. And then we have some of the money we, we also use to fund internal staff that do some of this hospital coordination work. Um, and, and we keep a, a small reserve because, you know, just in case we have some large hospital bills that come through for this population, we want to make sure we have the ability to pay that. Um, and so, and I think typically, historically, uh, Salem Health has not billed us the full contract amount. So we've awarded 475000 It's probably unlikely that they'll end up billing that total, but, but it's available for them if, if the need is there. Um, I don't know if I can help answer any questions about this. Good. No. Okay. Great. Great. Thank then you. I will take a motion, please, Commissioner Willis. Okay, Madam Chair, I move that we approve a contract for services with Salem Health in the amount of four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for the delivery of mental health services retroactive to January first, twenty twenty-two, through December thirty-first, twenty twenty-two. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Great. Thanks, Thank Ryan. You, have a good day. And now we'll move on to Public Works to consider approval of the purchase order with Tate North America Incorporated in the amount of $226,942.53 for the purchase of radio components for the ultra high frequency UHF radio replacement project through June 30th, 2023. I just want you to know that every time we talk about this, I feel like there should be confetti falling from the sky. <laughs> been a long time coming. Not quite. Not I know, quite but still, it's every inch forward matters. Oh yes. This That's is so right. great. Uh, good morning, I'm Brian Nicholas, Marion County Public Works Director. So I'm here before you with the purchase order for uh, the purchase of some radio equipment, so I'll provide a little bit of background. Uh, Public Works operates a UHF radio system. It's a small three antenna system. It's a pretty rudimentary radio system. It's more than 30 years old. Uh, so we have wrung all the life out of this. Uh, it's a simulcast, uh, originally designed as a simulcast, so all the antennas work in unison. Uh, but the simulcast has failed and this equipment is just so old you cannot get repair equipment. So it's, it's time to replace that equipment. It's primarily used uh, for public works operations, so all of our road works as well as our park staff and the ferry staff. Um, we use that as our primary communication tool. Um, the new system, well in, in the current budget, we have a, a, a project uh, budgeted to replace it and that's what this project is. Uh, we're proposing to build a six antenna site, which will provide much better coverage across the county. And um, we've selected Tate's TB9800 system as the platform. Uh, the great thing about that is it's a fairly basic platform, but it has the capacity, just when you buy the basic system, it uh, has the capacity that, um, you know, it can accommodate juvenile department services uh, using that radio system, dog services, other departments uh, will have access to the system once it's installed. And uh, it will actually also provide a really important backup system for the sheriff's office. So uh, we equip all the sheriff's vehicles with UHF radios so they can access that, uh, that system as well. So um, the system is currently in design right now. We're just uh, we're preparing to issue a contract to Tate to, uh, to do the formal design. So it's kind of in the pricing stage. The reason why I'm here with this purchase order request now, even though the system isn't fully designed, is like everything else in the technology world, prices are going up. 
uh, and uh, the price agreement that we, that we will be using for this purchase, um, the schedule for those price increases are August 1st. So new prices will go in effect August 1st. So what we'd like to do is purchase um, the controllers, eight controllers for this new system. It'll give us a couple of spares on the shelf uh, for, for backup. Uh, but it'll be the core system that we need for deployment. Um, we'll save about $80,000 if we go ahead and make that purchase before, um, before August 1st. Um, so anyway, uh, that is that is why I'm here, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the purchase order. I don't have any questions, but I love that you're always thinking forward and that you're saving money. That's a big deal. Yep. Well, Tate was nice enough as we were talking to them. They were nice enough to tell us, oh, you might want to order this quickly. Before. Well, thanks to them, too. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Thanks for saving us 80 grand. I mean, for sure you're going to spend it in the future, I have no doubt, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at least we'll find good use for it. <laughs> Mr. Cameron, did you have any questions or comments? I don't. If you're ready for a motion, I am. I'm sure. I'm sure I'll move that we approve the purchase order with uh, Tate North America, Inc., in the amount of $226,942.53 for the purchase of radio components for ultra high frequency. Uh, UHF radio replacement project through June 30th, 2023. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Okay. I will now pause the regular board session and go into a public hearing. A public hearing to consider an appeal of the hearings officer's decision approving conditional use, case number 21-062, Allied Rock. Good morning, Brandon. And Austin. And Austin. Good morning, guys. I have expected you to walk over here. <laughs> Thank you. For the record, he is giving us public testimony that's been provided in the last two days, which, by the way, was e emailed to us, so we did have a chance to review it. But now we have hard copy. This is yesterday. Jane. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I got this twice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we did. It's come twice. <laughs> Noted for the record. Okay, so for the record, please introduce yourself. Austin Barnes, Marion County Planning Division, 5155 Silverton Road, Northeast. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. All right, so for the record, this is Austin Barnes. The item before you today is an application for a conditional use permit to expand an existing aggregate extraction operation from 50 acres to 187 acres on land zone TC, timber conservation, located in the um, 1880, or the 1800 800 block of Old Mahama Road, State and Oregon. The applicant, Allied Rock, is the current operator of the quarry. The pro property is located on the north side of Old Mahama Road, approximately 495 feet east of the intersection of Old Mahama Road and Dusty Place Southeast. The property is improved with one general purpose building. Um, the property is currently being operated as a quarry. The property was approved for a comprehensive plan text amendment in 1993 to add the aggregate site on the property to the county's other sites inventory and approved for a conditional use permit to establish a quarry and a rock crusher. This was conditional use, or this, the case number was CP 934. <laughs> In 1997, the Marion County Board of Commissioners modified the conditions of approval relating to accessing the property for core use. This was conditional use 9681. And in 2020, the applicant requested and was approved to change the zone of the property from ES EFU exclusive farm use to TC timber conservation. Surrounding properties in all directions are zoned EFU. Properties to the north and east are large tract forest and farmland. Properties to the south and west are small to medium-sized farm parcels developed with residences. 
On March 9th of 2022, the planning director issued a staff report to the hearings officer indicating the applicant met all applicable criteria. On April 4th, uh, 14th, 2022, the hearings officer held a public hearing and closed the record. The hearings officer determined that the expansion of the aggregate site met all applicable criteria. And on June 3rd, 2022, the hearings officer issued a decision approving the permit with conditions. On June 21st, 2022, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife submitted an appeal to the Board of Commissioner's Office with a statement and filing fee. Um, the applicant has addressed all the criteria for conditional use at this time. If the request is approved, staff recommends the conditions found at the end of the staff report be applied, which include conditions of the previous cases, which need to be continuously met. The board has the options of continuing the public hearing, closing the hearing and leaving the record open, close the hearing and approve, modify or deny the request, or remand it back to the hearings officer. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Austin. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Austin? At this time. Not at this time. Great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. The applicant and or legal counsel, if you please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Alan Sorum. My address is 250 Church Street, Southeast Salem, Oregon, Suite 200. Uh, I am the attorney for the applicant, Allied Rock. Uh, you, it, we emailed uh, some of the documents that you referenced, uh, Chair Bethel, uh, in, into the record earlier this week. Part of that was uh, a form of an affidavit from the applicant. I, I have assigned a notarized copy. If I can just quickly approach and give that so you have the, the, the fully signed one into the record, please. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Barnes said, uh, this is an appeal of a conditional use approval. Uh, the hearings officer had a hearing in April, uh, reviewed the criteria, all the evidence of record, and, and approved the request for the modification of the condition of approval. This morning, uh, I thought I will go over a few, just kind of a quick 10,000 foot level summary of what were the issues that were in the appeal from uh, the state agencies, DLCD, ODFW. Then I will ask uh, a few of the other members of the application team to testify before you. First up will be Mr. Eric Staley. Mr. Staley is a principal engineer uh, with NV5. He's going to go over the, the site plan and explain you know why was this application filed how did we comply with all of the the uh, approval criteria development standards and then Mr. Sigmund of Allied Rock will come in and, and testify explain before the board just kind of general operations so you understand what they do uh, out there at the facility their role in the community the, the role of their product and transportation facilities uh, and in part uh, the consequences of, of the decision and because uh, that, that does relate to the criteria as well. Uh, finally, I'll come back and, and address any legal issues that haven't been um, uh, fully developed before. So uh, real quick, the state uh, appealed and while they raised a number of arguments, uh, it's really about one single issue. So the subject property is 187 acres uh, as Mr. Barnes said, it was originally identified as including a, an area that was part of a natural resource survey in the early 1980s uh, and identified as in one of the comprehensive plan uh, inventory sheets as a natural resource area for Stout Mountain for the protection uh, of uh, western rattlesnakes. Uh, there were four rattlesnakes that were observed in, in 1984 and that was a bit unusual at that time rattlesnakes are not endangered they're not threatened uh, they're very commonplace in many parts of Oregon Central Oregon Eastern Oregon Southern Oregon but they were not that common in the Willamette Valley in that time uh, the evidence that you'll hear is is that that population which was very small in the 1980s 
uh, subsequently decline and there is no more uh, any evidence of, of rattlesnakes on the subject property, the surrounding areas. So as this is a conditional use criteria or application, the criteria uh, requires us in part to determine is there any significant impact on fish or wildlife habitat? And that's been the primary focus of the testimony from uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, as you would, as you would infer. Uh, they basically are arguing, well, you know, you don't have enough evidence in the record, or you should take into consideration the fact that uh, habitat is, is different than wildlife. And, and they asserted that the hearings officer misinterpreted the, the uh, development criteria. And, and we submit that the hearings officer was right and that uh, when you're taking into consideration whether or not there's a significant impact on the wildlife habitat, whether or not there's any wildlife there, whether or not they will re return to that property is absolutely relevant. And the evidence in the record, uncontroverted, demonstrates that there, it's been 14 years since any rattlesnakes have been observed on the subject property or anywhere near, near it. Um, the evidence submitted by the state themselves indicated that biologists had, had uh, not just those associated with the application team, but others uh, questioned whether or not rattlesnakes were even uh, active in the Willamette Valley anymore. Uh, one of the arguments from ODFW and DLCD kind of related around more of a legal question. What's the criteria? Should we be applying state law? Should we be applying Marion County comprehensive plan policies? You know, to, not to get into the weeds too much, we, we do have a very detailed legal brief, and I could, I could read that all to you, but I'm, I'm trying to just go hit the highlights right here. We, we all did read it. Already. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, just for those though at, at home, uh, the question of, well, does do the statewide go, land use planning goals apply? Goal five in particular, and, and the short answer is no. Uh, Administrative Rule 660, Division 23, Rule 250, Subsection 1, plainly says that Goal 5 does not apply when you're reviewing these types of permits related to the application of an acknowledged comprehensive plan, acknowledged land use regulations. So when we're changing land use regulations, if you wanted to go ahead and amend the code, you would have to take into consideration Goal 5. When you're changing the comprehensive plan maps or the zoning maps, you have to take into consideration Goal 5. We did that a couple years ago. Goal 5 was applied. That ordinance became valid. It was not challenged by the state in, in, in any way. Uh, so now we just have to apply the conditional use permit criteria in the acknowledged development code. And, and any kind of argument that there's inherent problems with Marion County's comprehensive plan or the development code, I don't believe that's true. But even if it were, it would not be a basis in this quasi-judicial proceeding to deny or otherwise remand, condition, restrict the conditional use permit application in front of you. Your review is much more narrow than that. We're not here to offer an opinion. Is Marion County's comprehensive plan or zone ordinance, you know, the best that it could be or, 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 or does it comply with goal five? That's not before this board today. Uh, the other issue really would come down to, well, how much evidence is enough? to kind of make a determination that there's not this environmental impact. And we go over it, and you'll hear from our biologists uh, in, in great detail. But the short of it is, there was a survey in 1984, uh, three sites on the subject property, as it was configured at that time, it was 687 acres. Uh, there were four site, snakes sighted then. In 1992, a biologist by the name of Alan St. John identified two rattlesnakes, an adult and a, and a juvenile. The last sighting by anybody was in 2008, again by Mr. St. John, um, who uh, updated his findings in a, an online database that, that biologists sometimes use. And he even stated that the population possibly no longer exists in the Willamette Valley. Mr. St. John uh, surveyed again in 2019. He found none. Uh, the applicant team in 2021, in preparation of this application, did five surveys in the spring of 21, three more in the fall, had trail cameras, there was no sightings of, of any rattlesnakes or, or, or their prior uh, being on the property. Also, there's letters in the record from 
many of the neighbors, the, the applicant themselves, all providing corresponding uh, evidence that, hey, I've been out here for decades, never seen a rattlesnake. Um, even testimony relating uh, their experiences going back to the 1980s. So based on all of that, that's why we believe the hearings officer's ultimate conclusion was supported by substantial evidence in the record. Mr. Storm, can I interrupt you for just a minute? Yes, yes, Commissioner. Because you said something and I was, I just want to clarify. So in 2008, did, and I forget the man's Mr. name. Mr. St. John? Mr. St. John. Did he say he saw a rattlesnake or did he say that he didn't see a rattlesnake? Because it seems like he, he, he saw, he did see one uh, juvenile rattlesnake in 2008. But he also said that, that the population no longer existed. He, he questioned that it was no longer, uh, that there was a, a sustained population in the Willamette Valley. Yes. Okay. And that, it, it's a little bit interesting because that wasn't, that, that sighting wasn't logged into the public domain in any way until um, more than a decade later in 2019. Um, but that, that all of, you know, when we're kind of doing these decisions, we look at all the evidence in the record. And, and the question is, is, is there enough evidence to support the hearings officer's decision? Was, was there reasonable evidence in there that someone could rely on? And, and we think uh, that she appropriately weighed all the evidence, good and bad, and found that no, there's not a significant impact on, on the habitat. And that was the crux of the case before her, and I think before you too. So with that overview of, of the cases, the issues, and, and the primary reasons why we believe the hearings officer's decision should be affirmed, uh, I'll let Mr. Staley come up and he can kind of uh, ground these legal questions and, and put it into greater context so you understand uh, what property we're talking about and, and how it will be changed. And then I'll be back at the end uh, if there's any more questions. But I do understand that we have some people from the state testifying, so I will want to have a rebuttal. Sure. I just want to clarify that you are asking for Mr. Sigmund, the applicant, and Eric Staley to come and speak first? Uh, yes, and then um, Craig, Craig Toomer and Bo Marshall are also from MB5, and they're, they're here to testify as part <laughs> of the application. Okay. okay. So wait, Craig, what was the last name? Toomer. Thank you. And? Bo Marshall. Thank you. All right, well, I would like to start with Mr. Sigmund, if that's fine. We, Great. We defer to the chair. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I told you. I know. <laughs> I mean, I get it. But maybe they have a plan. There's a large audience. <laughs> Good morning. For the record, please introduce yourself, name, and residence. Good morning. Andrew Sigmund, uh, Sigmund Excavation, uh, PO Box 759, Lyons, Oregon. Thank you, commissioners, for your time this morning. I'll just share a little bit about uh, our company and our operations. I care deeply and personally about the action before you today, the appeal of our Marion County CUP approval by ODF and DLCD have the ultimate potential to devastate both my livelihood and that of my employees. I'm a fifth generation Oregonian, third generation in our family business. Seated in the audience today are my Dad, Lou Sigmund, uh, two members of our senior management team, my brother Alan, our operations manager, and Gibson Kinsey, our chief construction officer. I was born and raised in Staten, attended school here, met my wife Tiffany in the back corner. <clears throat> I've made my home here and built a life and connections in this community for close to 50 years. Rock is quite literally the building block of life. Without rock, we cannot build schools, churches, community centers, apartment complexes, medical facilities, or new homes. We cannot build or improve and maintain our power grid, repair existing streets, or build new ones without this most basic of materials. You'll hear from several folks today. You've already heard from Alan. You'll hear from Eric and Bo and Craig um, about our quarry and our operations. There's been much careful, thoughtful pre-planning work that has occurred for years prior to submitting the CUP expansion application in December of 21. These individuals are specialists in their specific discipline and the best of the best in professional services, consulting, and mine planning industry. These folks will tell you about the significant efforts undertaken at my direction to ensure that we're able to operate our rock quarry far into the future in a sustainable manner with care and concern for the land, the wildlife, and the neighbors. 
These voluntary efforts include noise and dust surveys, public safety analysis, public infrastructure impact analysis, traffic studies, wildlife surveys, hydrological surveys, Native American cultural surveys, historical artifact surveys, and mine planning and reclamation. So it's been thorough. A little bit about our quarry. If our previous approval is denied, the nearest active and permitted quarry that could provide similar rock is approximately 25 miles away in Silverton. Per our calculations, this will result in approximately 580,000 additional truck miles each year on county roads to move the same amount of rock currently supplied by our quarry. The mileage figure was derived using a TLE or truckload equivalent. This method accounts for the varying size and capacity, larger or smaller, of the trucks which normally haul from our quarry. <clears throat> to travel this distance, it will require approximately 124,000 additional gallons of diesel fuel every year, resulting in almost 1.5 million kilograms of excess and unnecessary CO2 emissions. The rock formation from which we produce our aggregate is unique and one of only a handful of quarries in the Northwest can provide this. We produce a material called switchyard rock, which is used for surfacing in high voltage power substations. This material cannot be sourced from sand and gravel pits, also known as river pits. And with the increased push to electrify cars, trucks, and all facets of our lives, the essential importance of this rock cannot be understated. What you won't hear from these specialists in the room today is a negative impact on our community. If the daily operations of Allied Rock are restricted or shut down, the impacts include the loss, immediate loss of 17 good paying jobs on 17 local families, the loss of weight mile taxes, employment taxes, income taxes, cat taxes, property taxes, and permit fees associated with the quarry. There'll be the loss of the downstream jobs and the income that Allied Rock supports through our numer numerous vendors and suppliers, and depending on which job multiplier you look at, that could be between 3.8 and 5.8 jobs, indirect jobs for every job that we provide. So that could be an additional 66 to 100 local jobs that will be impacted in addition to jobs at the quarry. <clears throat> Another impact will be the fact that Allied will no longer be a viable business capable of supporting beloved community events such as the San Am Canyon Stampede or the Detroit Fishing Derby no longer able to support school sports programs and local nonprofits. And that's something our family feels a strong responsibility to be a good steward of the resources we have, which include broad-based support of the Sandy Ham Canyon and surrounding communities. I've previously shared that I was raised and currently reside in Staten, with the exception of a brief period <coughs> during college, I've lived my entire life on Fern Ridge Road just one and a half miles from Stout Mountain. In that time, I personally never observed a western rattlesnake. I've recently traversed the quarry property quite literally hundreds of times in the last six years and have never observed a western rattlesnake on the property. Talking with neighbors and friends, no one has seen rattlesnakes in the last 40 to 60 years. The commercial nursery operations directly south of the quarry and the adjacent row crop grass seed and Christmas tree farming operations to the north have necessarily created large expanses of exposed soil which have increased natural depredation of the rattlesnakes and other small animals. <clears throat> the normal and orderly use of the nearby land for increased agricultural production coupled with my personal lifelong knowledge of the area and the thorough independent research that Craig Toomer and Bo Marshall who you'll hear from today have done on our quarry property regarding the western rattlesnakes leads me to the conclusion that western rattlesnakes are no longer exist on Stout Mountain or adjacent properties and as such Stout Mountain and our quarry property no longer offers habitat for a species that doesn't exist. I respectfully request that you all affirm the CUP approval by the Marion County Hearings Officer, Jill Foster, and deny this unwarranted appeal by ODF and W and DLCD. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions or comments? Not at this time. I have a question for you. Um, how long has um, quarrying taken place on this piece of property? Since 1970. 52 years. So this isn't a new use? No, sir. Okay. And then um, in your affidavit, one of the things that you said was you said 
the aggregate material from the quarry operation is hauled to projects in Mill City, Gates, Detroit, Idana, Marion Forks, Elkhorn, Mahama, Staten, Sublimity, Victor Point, Silverton, East Salem, Almsville, as well as other locations beyond Marion County. I know um, we just had a lot of construction happening over the last couple of years and recovering from, um, and still do, from the fires in 2020. Mm -hmm. sure. um, has your company been involved in that at all? And could you talk a little bit about that? We have, yeah, significantly, thank you. Um, we ran some quick numbers and um, we've supplied close to 11,000 truckloads of rock for the rebuild effort in the San Yam Canyon um, since the, the fires of 2020 um, and have participated significantly in that recovery event, both allied rock through the pro providing rock and our, um, our parent company, Sigmund Excavation, providing um, quite frankly, rebuild services from day one, but even so much as to be the first first ones on the ground opening roads and, and putting out fires at our neighbors' houses. So, yeah, we've been fairly involved. Would you say it's your opinion that if um, your company wasn't in business or wasn't there, it would have uh, made it harder for people to recover in the Santiam Canyon? Well, it's a little hard to pat myself on the back, but yeah, I mean, we played a pivotal role. Thank you. All right, next with Eric Staley, please come forward. And if you're gonna set up a poster board, which is great, could you do it on this side and set it just a little bit back from the table so the camera can catch you? Uh, yeah, that'd be great, thanks. <laughs> Eric Staley, uh, 9450 Southwest Commerce Circle in Wilsonville, Oregon. I work for NV5, which is an engineering firm. We have a whole lot of engineers of all different stripes. I happen to be an engineering geologist. And I've done uh, mining work, mine planning for approximately 22 years. Would you do me a favor and just speak louder or move the microphone closer? Sure, Thank sure. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. So, uh, We've been working on this project with Allied, Exc uh, Allied Rock since approximately 2016. Uh, we helped evaluate the property, looking at the prior mining conditions. Uh, they, they actually took over the property in 2017. The intent has always been to try and make this mine more functional than the way it had been in the past. Um, not only through the expansion effort to provide additional resource for the future use of the site, but also to develop a mine plan that will help um, avoid issues with the environment or with other kinds of concerns and also steer the site toward a better reclaimed condition for subsequent use of the site. It is always important for any kind of mining activity to think years, decades ahead to what you're going to do with the site afterward. And this site is, is designed to head towards commercial forestry when mining is complete. Um, a bit of on the geological side, the, the resource itself is the Columbia River Basalt Group, which is a very uh, significant resource for uh, aggregate purposes in our area. Um, it's commonly one of the best resources. It's a bedrock resource, so it has some uses that your regular sand and gravel pit would not provide, and I think Alan dis or, uh, Andrew dis discussed that. So um, with a, a bedrock site, we had um, we had plans for its development as a benched excavation into the hillside, which is what uh, Sig Sigmund is pursuing. And uh, if it's all right with you, I'd, I'd prefer to speak with alongside the sideboard. Okay. Yes. Oh, do we have a, I just yeah. speak as loud want, as I can. Do you have a microphone? Well, will you, you can... he, we still have to have you on a mic. So if okay. for now, just pause and she will grab one. Because <laughs> I realize that one's connected to the desk. That's fine. Thank you. Well, Believe it or not, I'd people, let him use mine, but it's... I dare you to take that out of there and see what happens. <laughs> hold this like a lounge singer and just get yeah, it. You can like, you know, Vanna White it from here if you want, but <clears throat> it'll give me time to clean my glasses so I can actually see that. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, okay. There you go. He's taking a, a two second, two minute break. It's a logical question. You would think green means go, yeah. but red just means on. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm staring at a thing I could just try to speak. Yeah. We're, we're not waiting for him to come back. Oh, you, sorry. sorry, no, it's I, fine. I apologize. I thought <laughs> no, we were. No, no, okay. no. Yeah, okay. go ahead. So uh, the mind plan that we're presenting here is sort of the current state of affairs. We have a mining disturbance that's this red dashed line. Uh, we then have the operations area down here along um, Hama Road. Uh, that is where the rock, the, the rock is mined uphill, is hauled downhill and is processed, meaning it is crushed and piled into the product storage piles, which will then be loaded into commercial trucks and leave the site. In addition, there's the equipment yard where you would have all of your equipment stored day to day, offices, the scale, all those kinds of things. Uh, over here, actually, the scale is right here at the left side and it has a call out for it. Uh, in addition, there is some stormwater management features here in the mine, in the lower floor, to collect stormwater from the site that may have flowed across disturbed soil or other kinds of uh, uh, impacted areas, and then is allowed to collect and infiltrate into the floor of that, of that processing yard. Uh, around the perimeter on the west and the south side of the processing area are uh, soil berms that were placed for the sake of noise attenuation to help safeguard the site from public attention and also to uh, provide a visual screen for anyone that lives in the area. So it's sort of a multi-use, but it also is an opportunity for us to store non-resource material like soil, which we would call overburden which has to be removed from over the rock before you can mine and, and access the resource itself. So those components are common to all mine plans, but what we wanted to do was uh, a few things. Number one, we wanted to improve the stormwater management on the site. Number two, we wanted to design an expanded site that observes the appropriate setbacks from the site boundaries. And number three, we wanted to enhance the berms and, and improve the general uh, facility appearance and uh, impact, to the, impact to the area. So the other figure that we have here is our uh, proposed plan going forward. So we have the permit area will consist of the entire property boundary, but there's a 100 foot setback that's observed around all the areas for any excavation. So that's the dashed line on the inside of this mine plan. External to that is an opportunity to store overburden soils and especially tops, especially topsoil. Uh, that is key toward reclamation, which I'll speak to in just a little bit. Uh, there's also an area that is designated for overburden topsoil storage over the uh, to the northwest. Uh, down on the floor now, uh, we have some enhanced berms, as well as an effort to take stormwater that hasn't yet encountered mining disturbance, any kind of disturbed soils or anything like it, and draw it to the mine floor itself. We did infiltration testing in the floor of the processing area and found that it has plenty of infiltration capacity. No, it shouldn't have any trouble keeping up with stormwater. So that's diverted around there. Up in the resource area, we've designated just at this time a limits of excavation. So, so where might the resource be extracted from? That again observes that 100 foot setback. Within that, we anticipate a bench cut at about one and a half to one. That means that it's going to be like a series of steps, steps into the bedrock. I apologize for this microphone. I keep I, I turning think it off. I so. think it's our fault, not yours. Yeah, okay. I think we should apologize. We should work on another one while you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay. 
through this all right yeah so uh, so what we anticipate is basically like a, a, a stair step geometry when we're done one and a half to one means that it will drop one for example 40 feet per bench but will extend 60 feet horizontally per bench so it will come down wider than it is tall effectively that will set the stage for what we plan to do for reclamation of the site where we will take topsoil around the perimeter and place it on those benches and that gives an opportunity to grow uh, firs or whatever other commercial trees ought to be uh, pursued after the mine is complete. Oh, uh, one additional feature that we show in this is that there's a plan to move the processing area uphill once there's sufficient room and once uh, certain other improvements are made. The reason for that is it's closer to the resource, so there's less overall hauling, but also it brings the, the noise and the activity and other things further and further away from the community surrounding the site. So again, this is sort of a, a diligent effort on the fact of the, of the mine operator to try to be congruent with its surrounding area. I think that's all I'll say in, as far as in front of the signboards go. Okay, thank you. Is this on? Okay. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here for anything you might have. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Toomer. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Craig Toomer, T U M E R, I'm 9450 Southwest Commerce Circle, Wilsonville, Oregon. Uh, I'm a senior environmental scientist with NV5. Um, since we're going a little long this morning. I will give a overview of our efforts to um, identify, to look for rattlesnakes and identify potential rattlesnake habitat on the site, and then um, allow you guys to answer any questions that may not have been answered. In spring of nineteen eight, uh, spring of twenty twenty one, we were asked by Allied Brock to. Uh, search for western rattlesnakes on the subject property because western rattlesnakes have been identified and documented on the site by Alan St. John in spring 1984 and the area had been designated a, uh, the Stout, as the Stout Mountain Rattlesnake Dens Natural Area. In between April and mid-June 2021, we conducted five site visits on the property. These site visits were timed to coincide with the time of year when Mr. St. John had documented western rattlesnakes on the site in 1984. During the initial site visits, we identified potential den sites. Uh, the 1984 report did not give specific locations of the den sites. They were just general locations such as the southeast side of the mountain, just below the rim, the southeast, southwest side of the mountain, and so forth. So during our initial site visits, we searched for potential den sites on the rock faces of Stout Mountain in the project area. We identified five potential den sites uh, where uh, there were fissures or holes in the rocks and rock faces where we thought rattlesnakes could potentially den over the winter. We, during subsequent site visits, we established trail cameras aimed at two of the potential den sites where we were able to have the cameras present a clear view of the den sites in the immediate vicinity with out having vegetation obscure the field of view in hopes of catching any rattlesnakes on film that may be emerging from the den sites early in the spring. We also established cover boards um, around the top of the mountain at the edge of potential foraging habitat um, in hopes that these cover boards, which are two by two plywood or sheet metal um, covers placed on the ground, 
in hopes that any snakes in the area would crawl under these to um, to shelter from the heat of the day, the cold, or um, potential predators. We also, during those five site visits, we searched uh, potential basking habitat and foraging habitat, habitat in the vicinity of the den sites. And during those five surveys, we did not find any western rattlesnakes on the site or in the vicinity of the den sites or elsewhere on the site. In early October of 2021, we conducted three additional surveys at the time of year when western rattlesnakes could be expected to be returning to the den sites for the winter. During those surveys, we had three biologists, myself, Bo Marshall, and Sergi, um, my mind just went blank, and another, another biologist from NV5 who all have experience in surveying for reptiles and amphibians, including other species of rattlesnakes. During those surveys, we searched the potential den sites and all available foraging habitat very intensively. We basically covered the entire side of the mountain, looking under rocks, under logs, searching basking habitat. We downloaded uh, data from the trail cameras. We looked under the cover boards. We had spotlights where we searched into rock crevices um, and under rocks as far as we could see. During those three intensive surveys, we saw several other, other species of snakes, two species of lizards, and two amphibian species, but again, found no western rattlesnakes. Um, based on our lack of observations during our eight site visits, combined with the uh, other documented sightings and the documented sightings in 2008 by Mr. St. John and the absence of sightings during another site visit by Mr. St. John in 2019, we concluded that the western rattlesnakes are likely to no longer occur at Stout Mountain. So I was just to interrupt you, I don't know if you're finished, but you said to the hearings officer that, um, let's see, Western rattlesnakes have a high degree of site fidelity and that they use the same area for dens year after year. Can you Correct. talk about that? Um, Western rattlesnakes, like many rattlesnake species, overwinter in dens that provide the appropriate temperature, humidity, and conditions for them to shelter over the winter. They typically, like I said, they do have a high degree of site fidelity and typically return to the same den sites year after year. That's why we tried to locate the den sites where Mr. St. John had documented western rattlesnakes in 1984 because if Western rattlesnakes are still present on Stout Mountain, then the most likely places to find them would be the den sites that they typically use year after year. So just to so, be clear, there's, there's clear scientific evidence that these rattlesnakes always go back to their same den. Yes, yeah, there, is, okay. there is. It has been documented that Western rattlesnakes and other rattlesnake species do have a high degree of site fidelity. And um, when they leave the dens in the spring, they disperse to foraging habitats, which can be as far as two miles away. Late in the summer, they start returning to those same den sites and spend the winter in the den sites where they have spent the winter in years before. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, Mr. Toomer, you, you mentioned the covered boards for snakes, and then you talked about potential predators. Can you speak to predators of rattlesnakes besides man? 
Um, yeah, there are, like other snakes, rattlesnakes, fall prey to a number of other species, hawks, owls, um, other snakes, um, other predators especially could take young rattlesnakes. Things like opossums are um, immune to some rattlesnake venom, so there are mammalian predators of rattlesnakes as well. And, and did you uh, see any uh, signs of those types of predators when you were doing your observations? During our surveys, we, I don't believe we, none of the snakes that we saw, I think typically uh, uh, prey on rattlesnakes. We did, we did see a bear sign on the mountain, so it's, it's possible that a bear especially could take a young rattlesnake. I did see red-tailed hawks um, on the site and a northern pygmy owl, which is a small owl, but a small owl could still take a baby snake. So there are potential, potential rattlesnake predators. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do you have any questions, Commissioner? I do. Uh, Mr. Toomer, in, in the document you submitted, you said it's unlikely that rattlesnakes would recolonize the area if they did not occur on Stout Mountain, unless the species were deliberately relocated to that area. Why is that? Because although rattlesnakes can move up to two miles from their den sites to forage during the summer, they're not a highly mobile species like a bird or an insect or a mammal, so they don't typically travel great distances. As far as we're aware, the next closest population of western rattlesnakes to Stout Mountain is about 19 miles away, um, near Lebanon. And it's extremely unlikely that uh, western rattlesnakes from that population 19 miles away would first of all travel 19 miles, but then travel 19 miles to the specific location. So there's really no nearby source population of western rattlesnakes from which individuals could travel back to and recolonize Stout Mountain. So if, if, if the western rattlesnakes no longer exist on Stout Mountain, then in your opinion, it's not a likely habitat habitat for rest, western rattlesnakes, is that, yeah, is if, that how you would if that? Stout, if western rattlesnakes are not present on Stout Mountain at this time, and we think they likely are not. If they are not present there, it's highly unlikely that they would occur there on their own in the future. Okay, and um, are you a biologist? I am a biologist. How, how many years have you been doing this kind of work? I've been an environmental scientist doing wetlands and wildlife studies um, in the private consulting world since 1989. So 30, 30, 33 years. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, Mr. St. John and, and some of his, his statements? Because this one, the, the 2008 one, um, I'm still a little bit confused by it. It, I, it, it says, this observation is posted as a record of a population that possibly no longer exists in the Lambert Valley. So is he saying that he saw a snake or that he didn't see a snake? Hey, yeah, Mr. Mr. St. John is a biologist. I don't know a lot about him. Um, I do know that he's a biologist. Um, I don't know his back, I know, I don't know exactly what his background is with reptiles and amphibians, but I do know that he conducted the survey of reptiles and amphibians in the Northern Willamette Valley in 1984 and published a document for ODFW that inventories reptiles and amphibians um, in the Northern Willamette Valley. In 2008, Mr. St. John documented, I believe it was two individuals, an adult and a juvenile, on Stout Mountain. In 2020, he entered those 2008 sightings into iNaturalist, which is an online database that is um, an online joint initiative by the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic 
society where scientists, citizen scientists, whoever can post photos and records of basically any plant, animal, or whatever that they, they document it. In 2020, Mr. St. John uploaded his 2008 records into iNaturalist. At the time that he uploaded those records to iNaturalist, the database, in 2020, he added the comment that his, the text from that record is, this observation is posted as a record of a population that possibly no longer exists in the Willamette Valley. So he, he posted that record to the database what, uh, 12 years after the initial sighting. And then, this is in, in your document, it says in his field guide, this is Mr. St. John, Reptiles of the Northwest, California to Alaska, Rockies to the Coast, second edition. He states that he returned to Stout Mountain on October 6, 2019, but did not find any rattlesnakes. He also notes, quote, local residents report not seeing any in recent years. Correct. So at the time that he posted that picture, he had actually returned and not found any rattlesnakes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Commissioner? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bo Marshall. Oh. I, I, I think we can just go to the... You know, it, well, I have a long list. So if you're done with your four, then I'll go with my list. How's yeah, that? Yes. Great. Okay. So there's several signed up. If you do not want to testify when I call your name, just give me a nod off. So I'm going to continue with the support. Um, Andy Heiberger. Good. You're not going to testify? Okay. Tiffany Sigmund, thank you. Uh, Carrie Blake, thank you. Lou Sigmund, thank you. Alan, I cannot read your last name. No? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Eric Hedberg, okay, thanks. Steve, is it Pfeiffer? Okay, thank you. Gibson Kinsey, thank you. <laughs> Jamie Dabrowski, Stacia Finley. Okay, that's all that have signed up in support. We're gonna move on to opposition and start with Greg Reed, ODFNW. I saw you here somewhere, okay, hello. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, please identify yourself and your residence. Uh, my name is Greg Reed. I'm the District Wildlife Biologist for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife out of the South Willamette Watershed District Office at 7118 Northeast Vandenberg Ave in Corvallis. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Commissioners. Um, it is the policy of the state to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. <coughs> The Marion County Comprehensive Plan identifies the Stout Mountain Rattlesnake Den's natural area as containing specialized habitat for western rattlesnakes, which are classified as protected wildlife, a state-sensitive species, and a species of greatest conservation need. Dens, or overwintering hibernacula, are the most specialized habitat that rattlesnakes require and are critical for their survival. Historically, rattlesnakes were widespread throughout the Willamette Valley, but due to habitat loss and persecution, there are only three known occupied sites remaining. This site would be the northernmost remaining site and the last known site in Marion County. The natural area protects habitat regardless of occupancy. However, we do not think substantial evidence has been presented to say that the site is unoccupied. Rattlesnakes are long-lived with a lifespan of up to 20 years. They are cryptic, and if present at the site, are likely in low numbers, <coughs> making them difficult to detect. An adult and juvenile were documented on the natural area 14 years ago within the lifespan of this species. The exposed bedrock and fissures that make up de the den sites are considered habitat category one per the department's fish and wildlife habitat mitigation policy. Due to this habitat feature being essential for the species survival, irreplaceable for this population, and limited on the landscape. ODFW's mitigation goal for Habitat Category 1 is no net loss of either habitat quantity or quality. 
The impacts from mining, if allowed as a conditional use, will irreparably damage the den sites by removing the rock that makes up the den and altering the unique suite of features that allow it to function as hibernacula. <coughs> mining in the vicinity of the dens may also pose a significant risk of disturbance to the noise and vibration inherent to the mining activity. Through the creation of the natural areas and wildlife habitat designations, Marion County recognized the need to protect unique habitat. The natural areas policy seeks to identify, quote, ecologically and scientifically significant natural areas that contain components that are unique to that area and location and cannot be relocated. It is the objective of the state and county to preserve and protect sections of these ecologically diverse components before they are forever lost or altered, end quote. However, the proposed development is inconsistent with these policies in the comprehensive plan because it allows development that does not avoid conflicts within the designated natural area. For these reasons, ODFW is respectfully appealing this decision and requests the natural area remain protected and impacts to the habitat be avoided through alternatives to the development action. If any changes to the county's protection strategy for the Stout Mountain Rattlesnake Dens is proposed, the change should be processed as a post-acknowledgement plan amendment this recommendation is consistent with the state's land use planning program and ODFW's mitigation goal for habitat, habitat category one, which again is no net loss of either habitat quantity or quality. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in your testimony, you stated, uh, we do not think substantial evidence has been presented to say the site is unoccupied. Can you please tell me what would be substantial evidence to determine if uh, the site is or is not occupied by the western rattlesnake? Um, yeah, I, I first would just make the point that we think that the habitat should be protected regardless of whether there's occupied okay, snakes Okay, but there. what would be the, what's the definition of substantial evidence? I appreciate what your position is, but I'm curious what actually, like, if I was to disagree with that, mm -hmm. how would I go and prove that? Um, well, yeah, of course, it's difficult to prove a negative, but I would say multiple years of surveys would be helpful. What is um, multi what's multiple? Um, I mean, more, obviously more than one year. Um, yeah, I think two to three to four or five. I mean, it's hard to say what would show for, for certain that there aren't rattlesnakes there, but I don't think one year is sufficient. And so what does it, what does, in your field, what do you do when you make an observation? So let's say that um, five years is what the state defines as a perfect period of time to make this observation. What occurs in that five-year period uh, in order for the observation of the snake to be observed? What do you do? Like what would our survey protocol be? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think we could advise the applicant on what we would recommend, but... Um, generally surveying during the spring and fall um, as the applicants um, consultant did is would be good um, like they said the snakes are um, likely to return to the den sites year after year um, so multiple visits in the spring at the den sites um, I would say that surveying the entire natural area would be warranted um, the applicants consultant only surveyed a portion of the natural area um, den surveys in the fall could have been, could have taken place too late in the year um, and at too low of ambient temperatures to find snakes. Um, there also could have been additional cameras placed at additional dens. Um, there's also the possibility of, of scoping dens, so using a camera to, to look down into them. Um, yeah, and then I guess cover boards placed out for one season. Um, have a lower likelihood of success. Cover boards often need time to kind of season on the landscape. Um, if they're out for longer, animals are more likely to, to use them over time. Thank you. Mr. Cameron, do you have any questions? I do. It's probably not related to this, but Mr. Reed, can you tell me how your position is funded? Um, I mean, pri primarily through license dollars, through the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. Um, I also get some so, state general fund and um, potentially some funds from Pittman Robinson Act and excise tax. Can, can you uh, give me a history of when ODF and W started to have to be funded by general fund dollars? Um, 
No, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not familiar with okay, one that. Okay, thank you. So hunting and fishing license is funding your position? I would say that's the primary okay. funding thank source. Thank you. Commissioner? I do have a question. Um, you mentioned uh, land use. Is your position that that the uh, we have the analysis that was done is is incorrect from a legal perspective? That, that they didn't follow the the um, the land use process they were supposed to. The hearings officer didn't. Um, yeah, in consult consultation with. Um, yeah, our other staff members, that was our position. So, so you think that the conditional use analysis includes a, a uh, goal five analysis as well? Uh, I believe goal five should be considered, yes. But do you think that that's a, a requirement of, of the analysis to, to approve a conditional use in this case? Um, I don't know that a conditional use is the, the proper way to consider the impacts to this natural area. But that's what this is, right? This is a conditional use application, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, yeah I'm sure I do have one that's related. Uh, Mr. Reed, can you talk about, I asked the question, um, to Mr. Toomer about potential predators in the area of rattlesnakes. Um, yeah, I would agree with Mr. Toomer. There are a variety of other predators. Um, there are avian predators. There could be mammalian bears, skunks, possums, like he said. Um, so, but yeah, but so is it uh, potentially, if there was only a couple of rattlesnakes that were sighted back in 2008, could they have? Uh, been overtaken by natural predators between now and 2008? Um, I mean, typically they've evolved with those predators on the landscape, so they're, they usually don't drive a population to extinction. But if it was at such a small population, um, I guess that is possible. But okay. Thank it's you. not what I would typically expect. Uh, going back to the question I asked you earlier about substantial evidence, I think you were going to state that you would give direction to the property owner to go through all these steps in order to prove um, occupation or not by the snake. Is that is that right? The state said make, puts the burden on the property owner um, in a situation like this. Um, we often work with property owners in similar situations to this and make recommendations for what sort of surveys would take place. I mean, we don't have the regulatory authority to tell them to do but, this. Okay, thank you. But you don't actually produce those, um, you don't go out and perform those tasks yourself? ODFNW um, doesn't actually perform the, the site visit and does the surveys and you know, scales the side of the mountain? Um, I guess it depends on the, the situation. I mean, typically the applicant hires a consultant to do that, and sometimes we work with the consultant on what we think would be adequate surveys. Um, that might entail site visits or accompanying them on part of the surveys, but um, yeah, we aren't typically doing all of the surveys for them. Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. might bring you back up if I process this question differently in the future. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Um, let's move on to Gordon Howard with DLCD. Are you present? Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Gordon Howard. I'm with the Oregon Department of Land Conservation Development. Our address is at 635 Capitol Street Northeast here in Salem. Uh, I'm going to not speak to the merits of the situation with the Western Rattlesnake. Our department does not have the expertise. We uh, defer to our uh, sister agency, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, on that. I'm here to speak slow, solely on the issue of how this application should have been processed. And, it is our recommendation that you find that the application should have been processed as a comprehensive plan amendment. The rattlesnake habitat is identified um, and in 
from early days of the Marin County Comprehensive Plan as a significant resource under statewide planning goal five, which protects natural, various natural resources, including wildlife habitat. If at this point um, the, there is a recommendation or a, a proposal to uh, remove that designation uh, for, for, for the substantive reasons that we've been discussing, uh, the proper way to do that is through an amendment to the county's comprehensive plan uh, to modify your goal five protection program, which protected that rattlesnake uh, den natural area, and uh, and perhaps also looking at the issue in terms of whether uh, a competing goal five resource, which is mineral and agri resources, which are also protected uh, under statewide planning goal five as a natural resource. Uh, we don't have any merit thought on how that would turn out. That would be a, a, a local decision for your board to make or, or your county. However, that is the proper way this should be uh, uh, should be processed as a comprehensive plan amendment to your comprehensive plan, uh, because uh, it is an issue of statewide importance, as indicated by statewide planning goal five and the process to to protect resources under that uh, that provision that planning goal. And that's all I really have to say unless you have some questions for me. I have, I have a question. Um, so this piece of property went through a comp plan amendment in 2020. And, and DLCD didn't weigh in on, on that. <coughs> and the, the TC zone that, that this got zoned to, uh, mining and processing of aggregate is allowed as a conditional use under that zone. So why didn't um, why didn't you guys weigh in when the the comp plan amendment was taking place process taking place well I, I think first of all we do receive a lot of comprehensive plan amendments uh, and we don't well, most of them we do not comment but on this particular one uh, the fact that it's a conditional use uh, uh, the, the protection measures for uh, rattlesnake habitat dens, uh, conditional use still requires uh, looking at the issue in terms of um, uh, in terms of it uh, of its impact on the goal five resource. And if you're going to change the protection program for goal five uh, through a conditional use, you should be processing concurrently with that a comprehensive plan amendment to look at. Um, amending your goal five protection program for the rattlesnake habitat. Uh, I believe under the previous zoning district, um, uh, I, I actually I can't speak to what Marion County's uh, code says as to what the previous zoning district said, so I won't, I won't say anything more about that. Because we didn't change the code since that plan went through, right? So the, the, the conditional use, the code that governs conditional use under the TC zone is the same for this particular thing when we did that plan amendment as it is now, right? And one of the, the parts of that code says that the county has to find that the use, well, I guess the applicant has to provide evidence that the use will not have a significant adverse impact on watersheds, groundwater, fish and wildlife habitat, soil and slope stability, and air and water quality. So, so in, why is, why is your your position that this has to go through a plan amendment if if the code actually acknowledges this concern in the in the conditional use process uh, commissioner willis i think the best answer to that is that the the goal five uh, overlay of the rattlesnake then natural area is essentially the equivalent of a of comprehensive plan or, or overlay zone although it's not a zoning matter it's a comprehensive plan matter and if you're going to take an action that um, essentially ends that provision of it being a significant uh, wildlife habitat area, you need to amend your comprehensive plan to do that explicitly. And that's, that's our position. But we did amend our comprehensive plan in 2020, specifically for this piece of property. Yes, that's correct, but you it's a conditional use. Um, you, you left, you didn't amend it to remove the goal five overlay. You amended the zoning district um, or the corporate plan and zoning district. I'm just trying to clarify, is your position that a conditional use application in process, is that a plan amendment process? 
our position is that in addition to a conditional use to allow this this use on the property you need to do a further amendment to your comprehensive plan to modify or remove the the the, the rattlesnake den habitat designation but the applicant applied for a conditional use right that was allowed within the zone that's correct yes and is your position that the that the land that the uh, hearings officer did not do that analysis correctly that that the conditional use uh, analysis was incorrect or are you trying to add a plan amendment that's not called for in the conditional use application? I think we're, what we're suggesting is that a, a comprehensive plan amendment should have been part of this process in addition to the conditional use. Is that is there like a statute or a rule that says that? Because I, I can't find that. Uh, well that would be in uh, Goal 5 and then Division 660023 of the Oregon Administrative Rules, uh, which indicates that when you're modifying a, a um, Goal 5 protection measure, you need to relook at the analysis and determine if, in, in the 40 years since it was done previously, things have changed that this is no longer uh, deems, has the level of protection needed as rattlesnake habitat, which for which you've received evidence pro and con uh, on that issue. But all we're doing here is we're looking at a conditional use. We're not, we're not doing what you suggest that. You're, you're suggesting that we're changing the, the plan, but that's not what's happening here, right? We're just doing a conditional use. Well, I think one way, to, another way to look at it is that the, the proposed change is not consistent with a portion of your comprehensive plan, the part about um, the goal five uh, rattlesnake habitat and to allow the project to go forward, you need to amend your comprehensive plan to, to allow this particular use um, in its entirety as proposed on that site. That feels like that's not what we're doing here, but I'll, I'll accept your answer. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Okay. Let's see. Jennifer Ringo, ODF and W, are you going to present? Thank you. Okay. Oh, it's crossed out, but it says okay. I'm not clear. Carol. Blue design. Yes. Are you going to speak? I would like to give my time to Peter Lonsberg. Okay. Um, he's not signed up. So. Okay. Well, maybe I'll get there. Just a second. Oh, I see, under Neighbors of Allied Rock. Is that, okay. So, uh, Carol, are you also going to speak, or just Pete? Yes. Both? Okay, so we'll start with Pete. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, please tell us your name and residence. Hi, I'm Pete Leberg. I live at 10868 Sigmund Road, uh, southeast. It's. Um, within hearing distance of the operations of the quarry. Uh, I appreciate your time, as I know that time and health are our most valuable assets. Uh, although greatly impacted by the Ally Rock quarry operations, I'm not as prepared as I would uh, prefer, as I did not know of this hearing until a couple days ago when a friend in Omaha Road uh, told me about it. In fact, uh, we spoke with people and some that live as close as 10 to 12 blocks from the quarry were not notified of this hearing. Um, there are a number of compelling reasons for my being here that require me to share the facts surrounding Allied Rock's request to expand operations. <coughs> Excuse me. A few, <coughs> a few of these are as follows. That Allied Rock has proven themselves to be poor neighbors unwilling to do even the most basic and inexpensive items such as planting evergreen trees on the roadside of their operations on the berm. These trees would reduce exposure to sound as well as reducing exposure to the site of the devastation of the hillside. When I suggested this a while back, um, I went to their job shack, which is about the size of a, a coffee shack. Uh, I was laughed at. Uh, only recently, in the past couple of days, uh, when I was aware of this hearing, did I look into the conditional use permit and discovered that it was indeed one of the conditions uh, so they have not followed. I'm that sorry, can you tell me again what, what condition they're not following? It was that they would plant 
uh, a barrier of trees for sight and sound. Okay, thank you. And they put the berm up and then laughed at me when I said, I didn't even realize it at the time, but they laughed at me for that. That uh, since uh, taking over operations at the quarry, they have increased uh, the blasting and mining many fold. Uh, property values in the surrounding area for uh, at least a mile in every direction haven't kept up with market because of that. Um, that uh, blasting and mining, there's artesian springs and where they're blasting and mining. Um, and it has, as far as we can tell, caused uh, damage to the artesian uh, water in the area, including our, our well. Um, and Carol will uh, get into that. Um, although these by themselves are sufficient to mandate the denial of the request to expand operations, there's another issue, well, probably a number more, but I'll address one of them. Um, the other issue I I bring concerns traffic, mainly from the quarry, but also from other Sigmund operations, uh, for the use of Sigmund Road. Uh, as an aside, I live on Sigmund Road in one of the original Sigmund houses, and yet the county owns the road. I don't. The Sigmunds don't. Operations of the quarry, quarry are and have been using this gravel road as a bypass between Omaheim and Fern Ridge Road, uh, both of which uh, are paved and connect with SR-22. Sigmund Road is about three miles long and almost all traffic is uh, from Sigmund operations to quarry and, and otherwise, which creates a lot of issues. Uh, they cause wet hoarding so severe that it is usually only a couple days after the county uh, grades the road that some of the residents in the area have trouble getting to and from their homes. Uh, it's also resulted in some costly vehicle repairs. They cause what is frequently a non-stop dust storm. The dust goes up 40, 50 feet in the air. Um, our home is known for having one of the top 10 landscapes in this state in sublimity area. We have people travel many miles and many hours uh, to see it. We offer free starts. Uh, over, we have over 850 different perennials. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, this level of plants and landscaping has resulted in uh, what my doctor says is a permanent reduction of my lung capacity uh, from breathing the dust because I'm not going to hide inside. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the health hazard, this ha dust has and continues to cause uh, property damage, uh, heat pumps, greenhouse roofs, automotive filters, uh, on and on. They cause and have caused tens of thousands of dollars of damage to the road, which would, has been paid by taxpayers. A recent example is a two-foot hole that, um, on a blind corner, uh, a very sharp blind corner, is directly the result of hundreds of loads of gravel going up the road. Um, some of these were in the, the double uh, containers. Uh, they caused traffic so dangerous that many times the uh, segment vehicles will only travel in one direction. There's so much dust, they're afraid to run in, that they'll run into their own trucks. Um, everybody I've talked to that lives on the road has mentioned at least one encounter with Sigmund traffic where uh, they had an air collision. Uh, there's excessive noise caused by the empty trucks rattling over the washboarding that they cause. Obviously, I've been talking about a county road and everybody can drive on a county road. So you might be wondering why I mention it. Um, it's not available to everybody. The answer is no. Uh, Sigmund operations at Allied Rock uh, operate under a conditional use permit. What this means is failure to abide by the permit, revokes the permit. In addition to what might be considered a minor matter uh, about the trees mentioned earlier, uh, there's an egregious and deliberate violation. The current contract states, and I quote, applicant shall endeavor to ensure that heavy truck traffic, including third party haulers, continue to be directed with sufficient advance notice as necessary to the east-west connection of SR-22, end quote. And yes, part of the reason for this was uh, the early use of a private road, um, Kingdom Lane, but it wasn't the only one. And that's how it states in their permit. 
by using this road, Sigmund Road, as a bypass, operations at the quarry give evidence of a lack of concern about there being a direct violation of the condition of use permit. In summary, Allied Rock has shown poor stewardship of Oregon's land and property, perhaps I should say no stewardship, a blatant disregard of impact to neighbors and others impacted by their operations and failure to abide by the conditions of the current permit. Obviously, there's money involved here. I feel like Don Quixote. Uh, however, these egregious violations of the current contract have resulted in sub significant expenses already borne by taxpayers and the potential for liability associated with that. Of course, <clears throat> promises will be made, I'm sure, to be in compliance, the same promises that were made when the original contract was signed. I'm unsure whether the county or Sigmund is responsible for the liability up to this <clears throat> point, but I do know that now that the county is aware of this, that the county assumes full responsibility if Sigmund's operations are allowed to continue. The county needs to mitigate future costs and liability by immediately revoking the current conditional permit for gross deliberate uh, non-compliance and, of course, denying the request to vastly ex expand blasting and mining. Additionally, I would suggest that the county place a commercial weight limit on Siegman Road, uh, 10,000 post vehicle weight, with the exception for farm vehicles, which occasionally travel through there as it would be dangerous for them to be on any other road. Thank you. Any questions, Commissioner? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Carol Lundberg. Good morning. For the record, please introduce yourself and your residence. Good morning. My name is Carol Lundberg. Would you please move the microphone to your mouth? You have a soft voice. My name is Carol Lundberg. I live at 10868 Sigmund Road, southeast in Staten. I've incidentally lived there most of my life. I've lived on Sigmund Road off and on for about 30 years. My home was built by one of Jacob Sigmund's grandchildren, one of the early pioneers of our area. One of the unique features of my home and of Stout Mountain are the artesian springs from an aquifer fed by the runoff from Mount Jefferson. This information was provided to me by a good friend of mine, Don Miller, a hydrologist for the State Water Resources Department for 31 years. One of these artesian wells supplies our farm with a hand dug, it was hand dug by the builder of the home in the 1920s. It's about eight feet deep. I've hiked and ridden my horse all around Stout Mountain for many years, and I know of quite a few of these artesian springs in the immediate area on both sides of Stout Mountain, including some in the area where the mining is currently underway. In the past three years since Allied Rock's purchase of the quarry, there has been a declining trend in our drinking water quality. The volume of water has not changed, but we have gone from not needing a home filter to changing one monthly. This change in quality coincides with the increased mining at the Allied site. And I changed it last night. This is less than a month. The filter is normally white. If this results from mining for only three years on 50 acres, I'm very concerned about the consequences of blasting and mining at the current level on 187 acres. My neighbor has had to completely replace her well system because their water quality had gotten so bad. The impact on this natural aquifer with expansion of quarry operations can only result in the potential ruin of this natural water resource. The original 50-acre conditional use permit application stated that the applicant, Mr. Sigmund, had engaged an expert to evaluate stormwater management 
on the subject property and establish that existing stormwater drainage facilities on the property can accommodate the expansion. But he's speaking of stormwater, not drinking water. So the runoff has been addressed, but why has no assessment been done on the impact of the aquifer supplying our drinking water, which comes from higher up on the mountain where the blasting is to occur? The Marion County Planning Commission has zoned our entire area as part of a sensitive groundwater overlay zone, zone number six to be precise. And according to the Marion County Sensitive Groundwater Program regulations, there should be hydrology reviews, studies containing surface geology, maps showing water use, well locations, cross sections, subsurface structure, and water bearing zones. Marion County Code requires the identification of all aquifers and springs before approving a conditional use permit. Before the approval of this expanded conditional use permit, I believe the following questions need to be addressed. Have the studies required by the Marion County Planning Division Chapter 17 regarding sensitive groundwater been submitted for review by the board? Will Marion County be liable if increased operations of allied rock is allowed, which will likely result in further contamination, partial or full, of this fragile aquifer? What monitoring systems will be in place to halt operations if our drinking water becomes further contaminated? It is evident that Marion County codes related to this permit request and the current conditional use permit are not satisfied. As such, it is ludicrous to consider an expansion. Instead, the county should immediately revoke the current conditional use permit until the conditions are fully investigated and met. Failure to meet the codes designed to protect our drinking water will open the county to excessive litigation and potentially cost taxpayers millions of dollars. I am not willing to risk losing my drinking water, nor shoulder the resulting financial damages due to negligence and failure to have the assessment and survey completed satisfactorily. Last night I received a, friend, a call from a friend of mine who told me that our attempts to address the board were futile at best. We don't have a lot of money. We don't afford fancy attorneys. We're just farmers and regular folks. We're just trying to make a living and live the best life we can and rely on our natural resources. We pay dearly every year to our governing agency to make sure the balance between its citizens and big business is fair. I hope we can trust this board to prove my friend wrong and prove that our well-being will not be sacrificed to big business just because they have more money. If that's the case, then heaven help us all. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Thank you. Okay. Don't have anybody else signed up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to come forward and provide public comment? Okay. Mr. Soren. Thank you. I will uh, try to cover a number of topics as quickly as I can. Um, on the general issue of transportation impacts, there's in the record a memorandum uh, from DKS and Associate Traffic Engineers. It's dated September 8, 2021, uh, evaluating whether or not there'd be significant traffic impacts from the expansion of this existing facility. And the conclusion was, no, there, there, there's not gonna be significant uh, transportation impacts. That memo was reviewed. Uh, and we got comments from ODOT, comments from Marion County Public Works Department. There was no, uh, expression for any additional conditions of approval or, or other restrictions based upon the expansion of the existing use. Uh, just real quick to make sure everybody has context, uh, we're talking about a general migration of the extraction area from its current site, which is on the far western boundary of the property, over time being able to move east. So while 
that the site is you know, considered as an expansion, we're not talking about actively mining all the property all at one time. That's not how practically it will work. Um, and, and so for individuals that are, are Western neighbors, uh, they're already as close to the mining activity as they will ever be. And over the course of time, blasting and mining activity and the reclamation work will, will move eastward. So uh, historical impacts will actually decrease from the common things such as noise, blasting, things of that nature. Uh, the, the last individuals that testified, the reason why they may not have known about the hearing uh, right away is uh, under Oregon law, uh, we provide written notice to everybody within 750 feet, and they live about a half a mile away from the, the subject property. So they're outside of the notification area. There was no procedural error. They're just farther away from that. Uh, as to uh, groundwater, um, this is not within the Marion County sensitive groundwater overlay zone. So a lot of the evidence and the criteria that was being discussed in the testimony was relating to standards that are in the SGO zone. Those do not generally apply to all development projects throughout the county. I think there was a really good Mr. back. Soren, oh can yes. We, can you go back just to the ground, sensitive groundwater overlay? Mm -hmm. Can you just, just talk about that a little bit? And Absolutely. Yes, this is not in that, but what does that mean exactly? So it is an overlay zone, which means uh, an overlay zone is a, a special type of zone that applies to properties regardless of whether they're farm or, or uh, residential use, and it's drawn to a geographic area, and it's trying to address a particular problem. In this instance, the o Oregon Water Department of Resources have identified a couple of areas in Marion County, uh, most commonly known as kind of uh, the Chinook Estates area and uh, a, another AR related property uh, a little bit east, southeast of the Salem metro area where there were observed declining static water levels of, of those wells. Uh, they are in what's called the marine sediment aquifer and that aquifer uh, has shown that it's had declining issues. So that's primarily related to the fact that you have a lot of rural residential houses out there. Oregon law gives everybody the right to, to pluck down their own well and pull out 10,000 gallons per minute. And all those houses that were developed in 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, that after years of use, saw declining static water levels. And so there were some restrictions placed on uh, exempt, additional exempt well usage in those areas. And Marion County, uh, kind of supported those state regulations in applying this overlay zone, which would require hydrogeologic review and studies in some cases if you're doing generally, you know, more residential development. So that was the problem, the policy issue at place, and how it related to the state issues, but it's, it's not in this part of the county. So just in layman's terms, because mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer, uh, basically, that overlay addresses whether the quantity or the long-term availability of water exists or not. Absolutely. And this is not zoned a sensitive overlay area because there is abundance of water for all who needs it in that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, it's a basic function of how big of a dirt do you have, how much water rainfall are we getting, and is the aquifer being recharged in relation to how much is being pulled out. And so none of those issues are in place in this case. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, we're um, gonna just, you know how we do this. Absolutely. Right? All right. Yeah, I, I happened to uh, up till four years ago live in one of those um, areas, and I know a neighbor who was subdivided. What they had to go through to to do that, but I also um, know that my well in that particular case, over a period of years, it was. 40 years old. The um, I had to install a filter system because mm -hmm. of how low it was going and the turbulence, et cetera, that was coming in. So that could be a possibility, especially with the drought years that we've been having on replenishing some of these aquifers as well. Is uh, my, my question is, mm -hmm. is the um, operation, uh, does it have a well? Does it, is it plan on drilling any more water? Or what, can you talk about the water usage in the area, even though that's not relevant? Yeah, I'll probably have Mr. Staley, who, who knows like the, operations and, and kind of the, the physical development the best. And he can also speak to, the, to um, some of the Degami permit modifications over the years. Eric, would you mind answering that question? You're yeah. welcome to, uh, you can just stay. He can join okay. you over there on that microphone. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you. And for the record again, please. Yes, yes, yes. Eric Staley, 9450 Southwest Commerce uh, Thank Circle. You. So uh, the site does have a well. The well is uh, located within the sand and gravel deposits that underlie basically the lower portion of the site. There's a previously in the ancient Santiam River laid down river gravels on that flattened area along the Hamer Road. And that's the water that they're pulling for basically strictly uh, uh, dust control. So, you know, fill it to a water truck, distribute it around the site to mitigate dust <coughs> emissions. Um, that use is not very significant in terms of how much water draw they have for that operation. They're not doing a massive washing process or something like that like you'd expect at a sand and gravel pit. They don't even mine the sand and gravel. That's just their operations floor. Previously, uh, so, so the site currently has a Dagami permit, right? And we're going to work in, intentionally towards expanding that permit if we were able to pass the county process first, right? So um, as part of that original Dagami permit, there were conditions historically about groundwater impacts at the site. There was concern early on that mining at the site might affect groundwater. And I, I don't have the records with me, but I believe approximately in 2009, Tagami con conducted an inspection with a, a new operator at the site at the time, but the one prior to Ally. And they removed the groundwater conditions for that permit. The, the, in their opinion and in, you know, in, in, in watching mining at the site for years, they did not observe an impact to groundwater. They understood that the, the mine is developed in a bedrock resource uphill. Yeah, right, yeah. So, so it's a different kind of aquifer. You have like groundwater, or ultimately groundwater comes from rainwater, right? And so rain would fall on the hillside and migrate through fractures in the ground. Uh, the, the groundwater that you would find in the sand and gravel aquifer in the flats below the hill would be recharged through the sand and gravel itself. So there would be a, a, a natural disconnection between those. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions, Mr. Staley? Uh, no, I'm good, Commissioner. Well, I was just um, yeah. legal counsel just pointed out that the applicant submits an annual report to DEQ for a permit detailing the amount of rock and. Um, as a condition of that approval of DEQ standards and permits, there's no, so they have to go through that process with DEQ. So you've been very gracious with your time. So I, I guess I will just close and, and respond back to DOCD's comments um, as, as to the criteria, kind of be ending where we began. And the, the bottom line is, and, and I think DLCD staff has been very careful with their words, and, and they use the word suggest. We would suggest that you should consider Goal 5, but we're in a quasi-judicial hearing. We have to apply the codified criteria. We're not allowed to go ahead and approve or deny an application based upon suggested additional criteria. Uh, to the extent DLCD is willing to actually argue and say as a matter of law, this decision that is in furtherance of the conditional use criteria is somehow inconsistent with goal five or it's implementing rules. One, I would say they didn't actually make that argument before this body. Two, even if they did, that would be inconsistent with the administrative rules that they're citing. They say goal five doesn't apply when you're making decisions consistent to acknowledge land use regulations. So their time to assert some of these issues that a concurrent amendment to the comprehensive plan inventory was, was necessary, uh, that's either an attack on your conditional use criteria and the regulations that you have. It's an attack on a, a pre-existing comprehensive plan map amendment zone change. I'm not entirely clear where their problem relies, but we do not have a legal authority to deny this application. We've provided substantial evidence for all the criteria, and I believe the hearings officer's decision uh, went through those arguments well. We offered some supplemental findings of fact that we would like the board to go ahead and adopt if they do affirm the hearings officer's decision, which address all of the issues, the legal arguments raised by, by DLCD. So, if there's no further questions, and I'll just kind of look and confer with my client, I think we can rest. Yeah. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Zorn? Okay. 
Would you like staff to come back? I'd like Brandon Great. to come up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Austin. The two of you guys. Uh, Brandon and Austin, would you please join us? <laughs> Brandon, you knew this was coming. That's why you're here, right? <laughs> okay, guys. So here's my question. Hold on. Could you please introduce yourself for the record since yes. you've not yet been up here today? Yes. Thank you. Brandon Wright, Marion County Planning Director. Thank you. Austin Barnes, Marion County Planning. Thank you. Commissioner Willis. So this is not a plan amendment, right? That's not what the hearing was about? Correct. What, what specifically is the applicant asking for and what's being appealed here today? The applicant is asking to expand the existing use of the quarry. Basically, they were limited to 50 acres. They want to be able to use the whole property for the same use. Um, and, and, it was the, a, and the analysis we're going through is for a conditional use permit. Is that correct? Correct. Conditional use permit. Correct. Is, do, is it required that we go through a goal five analysis in our conditional use process for this type of use in a timber conservation zone? Not specifically in the conditional use in the timber conservation zone, no. So the rules do not require us to do that, right? No. Okay. Does the comprehensive plan, does our comprehensive plan require us to do that? Does the comprehensive plan say anywhere that we have to do that when going through a, a process like this? So what the comprehensive plan says, at least in relation to stout metals, that's the stout rattlesnake mountain, is that when significant land use changes are proposed in the vicinity, and so we looked at this not as a land use change, as an expansion of the same land use. The use is staying the same. And the, and the reason for that is because we went through a land use change in 2020, right? Isn't, so isn't, that, isn't that's that right? correct. That's what we consider the land use change because that comprehensive plan changed allowable uses on the site. Because it was oh. EFU, and then it changed to timber conservation. Correct. Right? And one of the uses under timber conservation is mining if they go through a conditional use process. Correct. correct. So and mine, there's a certain amount of a mining allowed in EFU as well. This is just a slightly different type of mining of what you can produce. So the, the time that we, we changed the use of this property was in 2020. Correct. And we're not currently changing the use. No. We're just going through an analysis of whether or not to give a conditional use permit to an allowed use in the timber conservation zone. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. And in the analysis, the part that really we're talking about is whether the use, I guess the use, the, the applicant has the burden to prove the use will not have a significant adverse impact on watersheds, groundwater, and fish and wildlife habitat soil and slope stability, and air and water quality, right? Correct, yeah. That's the, that's the part of this criteria that we're really digging into with the rattlesnakes. And I'd say so. Is that right? Yeah. And so for us, our job is to determine based on the evidence that's prevent, presented whether the applicants prove that that's the case. Exactly. Okay. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Commissioner? No. I have no questions. I, I don't actually have any either. Uh, this was uh, a very informative day. I learned more about rattlesnakes today than I ever have in my life. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's because I, I went to public school. <laughs> uh, you can learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm, but not about snakes. Okay, well, then are we ready for a motion? Commissioner? Sure. I know it's his. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm ready to go. Great. Um, let me get my ducks in a row here. Okay. Um, so, Madam Chair, uh, after hearing all the evidence presented here, uh, I would make the motion that we close the public hearing, deny the appeal, and uphold the hearings officer's decision. I will second that motion. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Uh, I guess I'd like to give some some of my reasonings. But a lot of people Thank came you. here and provided mm -hmm. some some testimony, and so I want to I want to. Um, I want to provide a little bit of reasoning, I imagine you do as well. Um, I, th I think first to, I, I want to start at a high level just with some context. And there were a couple of letters that were written, one from Rich Duncan and one from Keith Owen. Um, and I guess I'll start with Keith Owens. He, he talked about after the Labor Day fires 2020, 
Um, many people and businesses got involved any way they could. Andrew Simeon was among the first to rise to the occasion. He made trucking and rock materials from Allied Rock available at a discount for those struggling to clean up and rebuild. He set up dump sites for the non-ash material that allowed an affordable and local place to begin removing debris. He controlled his contribution of all the rock products to the Detroit Civic Center was tremendously generous and a real gift to the community. And so I, I want to, I, I mention that because I think in a case like this, we're, we're trying to balance some things. And I think it's clear to me that um, our community would be poorer, not just for the employees who would lose their jobs if this company would go out of business, but um, the canyon would be poor if, if a company like this were to go out of business and we wouldn't have that kind of economic activity and support in our community. On the other hand, we have to consider um, the environmental impacts. That's part of this process. And um, I'm convinced after hearing what I've heard that it's very unlikely that there's western rattlesnakes in this location. Um, and so uh, my conclusion is, and, and based on what Mr. Toomer said, because the rattlesnakes that do exist are so far away, um, it's unlikely that there ever will be a habitat for western rattlesnakes here, that, that they, they won't get there. Um, and so, so I don't see this uh, approval of the conditional use as harmful to the western rattlesnake. Um, and I also, um, while I've, I appreciate um, DLCDs, and uh, ODFW's recommendations about how they would like uh, or suggestions. Um, I'm not convinced that that's actually the process we're going through. And so um, I think we have to follow the process that's set before us and we have to go through the conditional use process and I'm convinced based on those criteria that the applicant has met the burden of um, of obtaining this conditional use. And it was actually helpful to me to hear, um, I forget the uh, gentleman's name, but the engineer talking about um, the distance between the mining and the water. So mm -hmm. while there may be some impacts to water in that area, um, it's not from the, the mining. And if it is, um, DEQ will probably pick that up in one of their uh, annual uh, reviews. Finally, the only th other thing I want to point out is that one of the conditions of approval um, was to that the applicant will shall retain existing and install additional landscaping along the southern boundary of the subject property to serve as a visual and noise abatement berm. An applicant shall plant sufficient trees on this berm to act as a vision and noise barrier. So I also wanted to, to highlight that. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, if I may. Thank you. And Commissioner, I really appreciate your comments. I'll welcome all. Uh, I think one of the things about conditional use permits that we, Brandon, we started doing, I think, six years ago when Fenimore was here, we tickle them now and we go out and inspect and make sure those conditions are being used. So maybe some previous conditions were missed, but I think that um, in our planning department now, we're a little more thorough on making those, uh, making true. sure those conditions are met. And if not, we'll bring this back to us. Um, I always think of this um, when we sit up here as Marion County Commissioners making decisions like this and for the reasons that Commissioner Willis uh, just stated, but when we're making decisions like this, and I really appreciate um, the two citizens that came and, and spoke um, about their particular issues, uh, Pete and Carol, uh, they make a decision as a county commissioner. I, you know, I, I represent 350,000 citizens or thereabouts in Marion County, and we have to make decisions based on the rules that are before us and what is best for the entire um, county, and in this case, maybe even surrounding citizens that, that rely on this. And, I, and, and in the history of uh, my service, uh, I remember being in the legislature, and uh, this was a... The, Rock quarries were a big issue, and we, we really shut down a lot of the river um, because of fish, the river rock. And in this case, this is one of those quarries that is in the area that is delivering a high-quality product, and it is not impacting uh, fish and wildlife, uh, and we can continue to expand it. Um, I, I do appreciate ODF and W uh, being here, but I, I, I'm also concerned about every time I buy a fishing license, or a hunting license, and now we're relying on general fund because so much money is going into um, um, 
things like this, uh, it, I guess I probably even shouldn't be talking about this, but um, uh, yeah, I, I wish we would be spending money on uh, state police and getting poachers, et cetera, where people are doing things illegally. And it's harder and harder for people to even afford to take a young man out to, to um, go duck hunting or fishing because of the cost of those things. And I know that's not relevant to my decision here today, but I do have to put that on the record that um, uh, so I appreciate the citizens that were here to testify. I also understand we're making decisions on that that uh, are for the the, the good of um, the entire population. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I agree with both of you, and I uh, have a few comments of my own, not for staff, but mm. I appreciate that you're still here. I just have one question. Okay. Before you, sure. and then I won't say another word. Okay. What's in the box? <laughs> All my papers, I had seven copies of everything to give out, plus my own copy of everything. It's a big file. Just making sure you weren't hiding something from us. So okay. prepared. Maybe he has a rattlesnake. I bet his head. office looks like mine. I'm just kidding. Okay. So, um, Commissioner Willis, I really appreciate your points you as well, uh, Commissioner Cameron. And I also want to just uh, state into the record that while several members of the community in support of this did not testify, um, there are neighbors, uh, Mrs. Heater, Mr. Uh, Hafner, I'm sure I got your last name wrong, um, and a couple of others that, that state that this uh, use of the property um, as a, you know, a mining facility is uh, not troublesome to them, that they support it, that they're good stewards of the neighbors um, and the community, and we've heard extensively about the work that they've done, and as commissioners, we all know the work that Allied Rock has done, um, and the Sigmund families, uh, there's multiple of you up there, obviously you have a name named after yourself, um, and I'm deeply grateful for your heart-forward uh, engagement in the Sadium Canyon, specifically since the wildfires and 11,000 truckloads of rock. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. But the things that convinced me to support the denial of this appeal is specific to the conversation we had with ODFNW. So uh, Mr. Reed, uh, I asked him a specific question about the proof of substantial evidence, and it, it feels to me as if that's been provided uh, in the record. Um, Mr. Toomer, Mr. Marshall, and Ms. Blake um, are here, and they've provided uh, lots of information around their time up in this area. Specifically, the last paragraph of their letter in the record states, if western rattlesnakes no longer occupy Stout Mountain, the Stout Mountain rattlesnake dens natural area no longer provide habitat for western rattlesnakes. The conclusions provided in our initial report are not changed by the comments provided by ODFNW and DLCD is they have not provided any scientific evidence relevant to the issue of western rattlesnake habitation. What I find troubling, uh, aside from the fact that people pay a lot of fees and taxes to the state to do a job, is that I don't feel the state has done that job to provide any level of evidence. And I find it frustrating as a citizen, as a commissioner, that the state wants to move the burden on to the citizen to go out and provide that. If this snake, in fact, is such a needed resource in our community, then I would think they'd be more proactive to track it and know where it is. But it's clear that they don't do that. Uh, so I don't know how important it is, and it clearly doesn't exist in this area, in my opinion, with the evidence that we've received today. So I am a little concerned about that water filter. There, but that's not really what we're doing today. And I will follow up with her later to talk to her about options of water resources that could be provided to her to help make sure she's healthy in our community. Because dust is a problem when you live in the country, regardless of whether you live next to a rock quarry or not. So I have no further comments. If oh, neither of you do, then I am ready to take a vote. So if there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, the motion passes. Thanks everyone for being here. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank we you will Austin. now adjourn the, excuse me? I just said thank you. Oh, close the public Fair hearing enough. and go back into regular board session where I have lost my agenda in this plethora of paperwork. There's nothing else on it, so therefore we are adjourned. Have a good day.